Great. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for an opportunity to talk to everybody, and thanks for a virtual meeting. It's a, an unusual time, something we talk a lot about in uh, the medical geography program. And uh, if you're really interested in pandemics or public health or uh, sort of spatial patterns of disease, uh, we have quite a large and growing uh, medical geography program. So I'll give a little plug if uh, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, we have a number of classes that uh, might give you some insights onto uh, the ongoing uh, pandemic that we're all stuck with and struggling with now. Um, and then today I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of other zoonotic diseases. So this uh, pandemic uh, reflects a disease that originated in animals, spilled over into humans, and is now in a phase of sustained human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, the two diseases, or the disease I'm going to talk about next, and I apologize, I just got done talking about um, two zoonoses, anthrax and brucellosis, and I probably will touch on brucellosis today. Um, so the current uh, COVID-19 is a type of uh, coronavirus, and uh, that virus uh, probably originated in a bat. That's what the most compelling genetic evidence suggests. Then it spilled over into what's called an amplifying host, so another animal species that could amplify the amount of virus to get it over into humans. That probably happened in a wet market. Um, if you're unfamiliar with wet markets, they're not nearly as exotic as you might think they are. They happen all over the world all the time. If you're a hunter or no hunters here in the south, uh, every time you shoot a deer and don't want to process it yourself, you take it to uh, processor. And if you're handling animals in that environment, uh, that's a wet market. Now, some wet markets like those uh, uh, in Asia and those in the tropics uh, like in Africa can have quite a diversity of species being slaughtered. But uh, the idea of animals interacting with humans in a market uh, shouldn't be that novel. What's novel about this particular virus is that it has survived the evolutionary leap from uh, animals into humans and is now sustaining in human-to-human -human transmission. Now we've seen other zoonoses like that that we're familiar with. We see it every year uh, with influenza. Uh, the difference is how that virus reassorts from year to year, whether it's a seasonal flu or pandemic flu. Remember pandemic is just how big the outbreak is and how widespread. Uh, other viruses that you're probably familiar with, particularly if you're interested in the tropics that are zoonotic, are things like uh, Ebola virus and Marburg virus, um, also viruses that most likely originate in bats. Um, across other parts of the tropics uh, and subtropics, we see uh, diseases like Nipah, which uh, again, another bat-borne born virus that's often transmitted through fruits when those bats feed on the fruits and leave saliva behind. And in Australia, uh, something called Hindra virus, which uh, typically ends up in horses, and then we see veterinary cases associated with the horse virus. Um, and then other zoonoses are things like uh, HIV, right? Originally started as an animal to human transmission, probably from eating a primate, uh, and now sustained human to human transmission. Uh, my work is on zoonotic diseases, so those that are in animals that spill over to humans, and most of my work focuses on bacterial diseases. So these bacteria can infect both animals and humans. Now, uh, the one I'm going to focus on today, anthrax, is what we call a non-contagious infectious disease. So what that means is when a human gets anthrax, they're not going to transmit anthrax to uh, someone else directly. Um, every once in a while we'll see a rare field report where an adult caring for a child with anthrax may get uh, a lesion, a, a skin infection, but it's very rare. So typically when you see uh, anthrax, so for example, if someone had an anthrax infection and got on a plane, they're not going to transmit that disease like if they got on a plane with COVID-19. Um, Specific to this uh, audience, uh, I thought I'd talk about anthrax in the tropics. We typically think of anthrax as a grassland disease because it's a, evolved in, in uh, hoofstock, uh, but we do see it uh, across uh, much of the tropics. So I'll try and talk a little bit about some of our own labs work there 
uh, and then uh, some uh, ongoing studies. Um, get the slides to advance here. So uh, my lab, uh, it's actually our lab now. I uh, co-run this lab now with Dr. Michael Norris. Uh, so I'm a medical geographer and, and sort of field ecologist uh, that does a lot of microbiology. And Dr. Norris is a well and classically trained micro and molecular biologist that does a lot of field work. So Mike and I consider ourselves the bookends of these uh, pathogen transmissions. He studies it from the cellular level out, and I study it from the landscape level in. Um, and of course, nothing that I'm showing today is my work, it's our work. And uh, the lab I have, the Spatial Epidemiology and Ecology Research, or SEER lab, uh, is uh, currently uh, 11 people, and we, we usually hang between 10 and 14 people on staff. Also, I will share these slides uh, with, uh, as a PDF. Uh, there are two links. If you're interested in what I talk about today, I had an opportunity to do a couple of podcasts, which was really cool, um, with something called Outbreak News Today. And so these are long uh, format discussions on uh, our work on global anthrax and our work on investigating a very large livestock and wildlife anthrax outbreak in West Texas last year, probably the largest in a century. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Bacillus anthracis. So we have to know a little bit about bacteriology here to, uh, to try and put this disease into perspective. And this is an interesting pathogen because the bacteria itself forms a spore and that spore can survive in the environment. Uh, as long as the conditions are right for its survival, it can survive for years or even decades. Um, the challenge though is that when that spore is in the environment, uh, that uh, spore is essentially metabolically inactive and it's not evolving. So its uh, DNA signature remains unchanged. Its genome remains unchanged. So we have to think about what molecular markers are appropriate for understanding evolutionary changes in Bacillus anthracis because it's four forms. Then we get the Bacillus anthracis that causes anthrax. So anthrax is a disease. Bacillus anthracis is the species that causes it. Uh, when you get an anthrax infection, that is caused by those vegetative cells. So once those spores enter the body, into the bloodstream, uh, those cells, when they're in the right environment in the body, those cells germinate, and those spores break down and become vegetative cells. And then in the process of its life cycle, it releases three toxins that in combination cause anthrax. So a couple of things. One, if an animal survives anthrax, and in, to some extent humans survive anthrax, uh, we might get an antibody signature. So you're probably familiar with this right now with COVID as well. There are two kinds of tests that you can run when someone or an animal is infected. The first is called an antigen test. So uh, if you uh, have had your uh, nose swabbed and you felt like they were trying to stab your brain uh, for COVID, for return to work or return to school, that was to test for live virus to see if you or we were infected with the virus. We would call that an antigen test. Um, the second kind of test is after we have cleared the infection, we mount antibodies, meaning that our bodies have built up a response to that pathogen. Uh, so when we uh, survive an infection and mount an antibody response, we can detect exposure. So uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is if you're antibody positive, it means you've been exposed. Maybe you were sick, maybe you weren't. You just had a high enough infection to, to cause an antibody test. Um, but the timing of when we become antibody positive differs from disease to disease. But we can track exposure with antibody and we can track infection with, uh, with something like the PCR test that we had for COVID. The other thing that happens with anthrax, once those cells start replicating in the host, when cells are replicating, that's when genetic 
mutation happens from cell uh, replication to replication. And so if we want to track evolution, that's a different set of markers to track in situ or in the host evolution compared to trying to track environmental evolution where that bacteria is stuck in a spore. With something like viruses, like COVID or Ebola or HIV, um, they are changing constantly. So their time signature for their evolutionary change would be very different than bacteria. Also, viruses have a very, very small genome, orders of magnitude smaller than anthrax or Bacillus anthracis. Now, one of the other things that my group has been working on a lot, um, and I should say that in my group, we have both a microbiology capacity and a spatial epidemiology GIS capacity. So we spend as much time in the field doing field work as we spend in the lab doing lab work. So we have a full biosafety level three and biosafety level two facility at EPI. If you're unfamiliar with biosafety levels, the higher the level, the higher the consequence of infection if you're infected with the organism. So for example, Ebola would be what we call a biosafety level four. That's because there is no cure for Ebola. So the consequence of infection could be lethal. In the case of anthrax, is what we call a high consequence pathogen. It's a very high risk of infection, and the consequences could be high, but it is treatable. Uh, anthrax is a, caused by a bacterium, so antibiotics work. <clears throat> In the case of something like Ebola or COVID, those are viruses, and antibiotics <clears throat> don't work against those. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I was going to say something on that slide and got off topic. Very professorial, the semester must have started. So what you're looking at on screen here is one of the major challenges that we face in the African tropics when we think about Bacillus anthracis. Classically, anthrax is caused by Bacillus anthracis. Now the bacterium itself belongs to a complex, meaning there are multiple species that are so closely related that it can be hard to distinguish them. Bacillus anthracis belongs to what we call the Bacillus act complex. Bacillus anthracis, Sirius, and Therengensis. Now evolutionarily, we think all of those evolved from Bacillus Sirius. What we find is that Bacillus Sirius tends to be a saprophyte, a true environmental pathogen. Bacillus anthracis is a pathogen that can survive in the environment but invades mammalian hosts. And then Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacterium in the complex that invades insects. So we use Bacillus thuringiensis in our gardens and uh, in our neighborhoods all the time to reduce insect populations. What you're looking at on screen here is one of the big challenges that we face in the African tropics with anthrax. What you're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen is Bacillus serious biovar anthracis. So Bacillus serious, <clears throat> several strains of it, can cause pneumonia in humans, but it is not uh, doesn't behave like an anthrax infection. However, there is a biovar or a variant of Bacillus anthracis that was identified in the early 2000s in Thai National Park associated with a chimpanzee death. And a few years later, further south and east of Cote d'Ivoire, there was a gorilla death in the Congo. And that gorilla death and those early chimp deaths were from this Bacillus serious biovar anthracis. Now for the first several years, they reported it as anthrax because their genetic markers couldn't distinguish anthracis from serious, but they could detect the two plasmids that are associated with those toxins. So a few moments ago, I said anthrax is caused by toxin release. Both of these bacilli can transmit those toxins. So it's a B serious with the anthrax toxins. Now, the reason I have these two slides or these two plates, so what you're looking at facing you are two bacteria culture augers. And on the left hand side is B serious biovar anthracis, on the right hand side is B anthracis. And as you can see, they're virtually indistinguishable. They look the same. The reason that's a big deal is that these shouldn't look the same at all. In fact, they should look very, very different from each other. What makes those plates red is that those plates have blood in them, sheep blood. 5% by volume of that media is sheep blood. And those Bacillus serious cells will 
digest that and leave a ring, a clear ring around themselves traditionally, and Bacillus anthracis will not. It's what's called non-hemolytic. So right away, you can see that our single first defining characteristic of B serious versus anthracis is missing. This leads us down a rabbit hole of diagnostic challenges. So if you are in an anthrax zone like Texas, where it's so far the only pathogen that behaves like anthrax, you could stop here and say that's enough to go respond to an anthrax outbreak. In the tropical Africa, it is not enough because it's two different species causing disease. Now, the other thing I want to talk about today is that throughout this talk, you're going to see these three circles appear in the top right of many of the screens or slides. And that tells you when we're thinking about anthrax as its life in the environment or its life in the host in blue circles. And by host, I mean mammals, humans or animals, or the environment where that pathogen reservoir. So what are the conditions for the pathogen to survive? Because it is a spore former, once that host dies, if the host dies, for example, a cow or a deer dies and its blood returns to the soil, that becomes what we call a local infectious zone or a LIS, where that bacteria is maintained and that's going to kick off an outbreak next time. So each of these three circles are going to come up. Now, anthrax is also what we call an indirect transmission event, meaning that the host has to come into contact with the pathogen, but two hosts aren't going to cough on each other and transmit anthrax, like two people with COVID hanging out for 15 or more minutes with no masks are likely to transmit COVID. Okay, so what is the SEER lab? Well, it's all of these things that come up on screen. We have an extensive uh, travel itinerary in front of us, an extensive travel log behind us, in that we spend a lot of time out in the field understanding the pathogen on the ground. Uh, in the top center is our BSL-3 PCR lab, meaning we can do our own polymerase chain reaction right in the BSL-3. The bottom left, part of our lab staff working in a biosafety cabinet. Uh, you can see all the personal protective equipment there. This is a normal working day in the lab in a BSL-3. And then on the two photos to the right-hand side, first in the top right, two of our partners that we work with routinely in Ghana studying anthrax. And in the bottom right, a now outdated photo of our GIS lab because it's in the process of being moved to a new space in the center of the geography department. So hopefully next time it'll be there. So let's talk about what we do with the geography of anthrax and then we'll, we'll drill down into the situation in the tropics. Uh, one of the things we do on the GIS side of things or the spatial modeling side of things is we do a lot of niche model or covariate modeling to try and understand the relationship between where we've documented outbreaks or what we call the known disease occurrence, environmental conditions or covariates or variables that describe the environment, putting those together in some kind of a modeling environment. So here we say rules that link outcomes or fitted models. So what we're trying to do is find non-random relationships between environmental conditions and where we know something has occurred, and then predict that onto the landscape of all the possible places where those conditions are met. What happens in that fitted formula piece is a whole series of semesters on whether you want to do uh, maximum entropy modeling or boosted regression trees or random forests or some kind of genetic algorithm. Their ultimate goal is the same, to try and identify where on the landscape something should occur, and then which model we use is, is, uh, needs to be done on a case by case and debatable, uh, which is best. In the uh, bottom of this map, I show you two things. First, all the black dots are important because those are all known anthrax occurrences that we could map uh, from uh, about 1935 to present. And then the the choropleth map at the national level in the background is how many outbreaks have been documented uh, over that 12-year uh, period from 2005 to 16. And you can see there's a disconnect here from 
places where we have outbreak data and black dots sitting on top of a country that is dark green or zero. So there's a mismatch between what's reported nationally or internationally and what happens on the ground. And this is not uncommon for zoonotic diseases. It's also not uncommon for diseases of consequence. In the case of anthrax, with all of the stigma associated with it as a biological weapon, because it has been used in biological weapons attacks in the past, there's a lot of political stigma and bureaucracy associated with anthrax that discourages farmers from reporting it. So we've got this mismatch of some knucklehead put it in an envelope and made the world scared of anthrax, but it's a disease that happens in livestock and wildlife around the world uh, almost every month, depending on whether you're north or south of the equator. Now, one of the things that we've tried to do is model it sort of country by country, and we've done that in a couple of ways. So one is just learning where all the outbreaks are and trying to model those. The other is trying to model those based on their genetic fingerprints or what we call genotype. So if we've recovered that bacterium using our lab or a partner lab that can do it, uh, we want to know what genetic lineage it fits in. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. But the idea is if we get better at knowing whether it's a red fish or a blue fish, then we can map the red fish versus the blue fish rather than mapping all the fish uh, to, uh, to borrow a term from Dr. Seuss there. But if we want to know which kind of Bacillus anthracis is dominating the outbreaks, uh, that helps us get better at doing those genetic algorithms. From the first US map to the second that I've shown, what you're looking at there is what happens when we model all the outbreaks mapping the area in red versus the area in red when we map a single lineage. And you can see there is a much more disjunct distribution of a single lineage than all the outbreaks. Then we also work with international partners through workshops, through field work, through uh, joint studies and publication modeling country by country. Um, and so the couple that I'll focus on today are, are Vietnam and Ghana because they fit uh, squarely within the tropics. Um, if we sort of think about the pathogen and what's in the reservoir, uh, it's a complicated scene, even though it can survive as a spore former for a long time. Uh, that means two things. One, it's relatively easy to transport it around the world. In fact, historically, the way anthrax sort of radiated worldwide was through the bone meal trade. So it survives in bones for long periods of time. And prior to sort of synthetic vitamins and, and alternative means of getting nutrients to animals, uh, the bone meal industry would uh, grind up bones and put them into a mixture and then sell those around the world. And a lot of Bacillus anthracis was moved that way. Um, what we see just on this map is Texas, Colorado, and Montana. These are areas where that single lineage, what we call the Western North American lineage, uh, has been isolated. So what you're looking at in this tree here, if you're unfamiliar with these, is that the closer two things are to each other, the more similar they are, then the further out the ring you have to go to find a neighbor, the less genetically similar they are. So we've been using those genetics, genotyping our strains and placing them onto these, what we call phylogenies or phylogenetic trees. And then again, rebuilding those models from some of our early work to more recent work. So this is a paper by Annie Yang, one of our most recent PhD grads in the lab, now a, a postdoc out of Colorado State with USDA. Um, and you can see that from modeling the continental United States for all outbreaks to just the Western North America, we predict a lot less of Texas in red or in high confidence than we did in the previous map. And that's because there are several other genotypes on this tree that are not colored in orange, green, or blue that actually drive those outbreaks in Texas. So if we look at Texas, it's actually dominated by not that Western North American strain, but it's actually dominated by something we call volum, something we call aims, and this thing that we identify as the stern strain. Those are the dominant lineages in, in Texas with volume and aims uh, causing the most deaths. 
Now, when we look at the situation in uh, Central Africa, we see a completely different lineage. So one of the first things about anthrax in the tropics in Africa is that the strains there and moving uh, north and south out of the tropics are different than what we see in other parts of the world. Now, we still see some evidence of volume in parts of westernmost uh, Africa, and we see some other lineages out through Kenya and Tanzania. But uh, in West Africa, we have a very interesting group of strains that are called the WAG or the West African strains. And here you can see that Chad, Cameroon, and Nigeria all just sit on one branch. Uh, that says that they're all part of that group. And what's unique about this branch is it lacks a polysaccharide on the, uh, associated with the spore. The polysaccharide is kind of sugar, and that probably plays a role in the way infection works. And so these WAG strains probably cause a more severe and a more rapid onset of anthrax than other strains. That's something that Mike Norris is leading in our lab right now. So I put that in perspective that what's out there is complex. And so our global models are a very important first estimate of the distribution of anthrax globally. That's what you're looking at here in the center of the screen, the full map. Um, and this has since been published in Nature Microbiology. And this gives us a first pass at where we think anthrax is most likely persisting. And that's important for policymakers. The first step is to know where to look. And then you can start staging control measures around that. The other thing we do with these models is start to estimate what are our human populations in the red zone of that previous map? What are our wildlife populations? And then in the top right, what are our livestock populations? So control of anthrax is truly one help. That's a concept we hear all the time, but it's absolutely true for anthrax. And that is, if you control it in livestock, you will reduce the amount of risk in humans. Now the challenge is that's an injectable vaccine. So that's realistic and feasible to go out and grab a cow and inject it. It's less so for something like a bison or a saiga antelope that's free ranging in the wild, where we may be able to do that with a dart gun, but it's unlikely. And we certainly couldn't do it to establish herd immunity at a high success rate. So there's a couple of things about uh, anthrax that are interesting when we think about control. So first, this is a uh, uh, little bit outside of the tropics, looking at the Republic of Georgia and the Caucasus, but a couple of things I wanna point out here. One, anthrax, even though it's a, an old disease or what we call a disease of antiquity, is still causing problems today. And what you can see here in Georgia is that from 2000 to 2012, the problem was getting worse. So even though we can control it well with vaccine, it was not being controlled well. Two things to keep in mind here, the gray, or excuse me, the tan color in the histogram tells you that um, that's the livestock herders or the livestock handlers population of anthrax, a rural population, peri-urban in red and urban in dark red. So we're using some remote sensing to identify those three classes and looking at human disease. So what you're looking at here is that over time, over that, uh, this, uh, 13 year record, we see an uptick in human anthrax, particularly in the last three or four years of that data set. And even though urban anthrax in major cities is relatively low in proportion to rural, that's expected for a livestock zoonosis. But notice that over time, that dark uh, burgundy part of the histogram, the proportion of that increases, meaning that that meat is making its way into the urban markets through things like uh, illegal street markets uh, or markets that are outside of the national surveillance, right? So it's outside of commercial meat, which is outside of, of meat inspection. So that's the first thing to note that where the anthrax risk is, is changing. It's not just out where the agriculturalists are, but it's making its way into the city. Uh, I also wanna point out, this is from Ian Kratchlik's uh, dissertation, which was also in the department. He's now with CDC. Um, what you're looking at here is sort of that same histogram now in all gray, just to, just to show you 
um, that human anthrax really spiked. Look at the black dashed line, really spiked from 2010 onward. What I want you to focus on here is the black solid line where it really spiked in 2005 or six and then completely collapsed. That's when the Republic of Georgia ended its compulsory vaccination program. Uh, just prior to that, the Canadian government ended its compulsory vaccination program, which was one of the last Western countries to have compulsory vaccination. And so once that country quit, most every other country quit. And we see that as the vaccine uh, dis distribution changed, human anthrax increased. So just to be clear, they stopped vaccinating livestock and the human disease exploded. The other thing that's important about that is who was affected. So what you're looking at on the bottom is the ethnicity associated with those individual cases. And notice that the Armenian nationals, so these are uh, an Armenian enclave, or excuse me, Azerbaijani enclave in Georgia. So it's a community that speaks Azerbaijani, reads the Azerbaijani alphabet, which is not Georgian, and has a lot of Azerbaijani cultural practices, is the most affected. So that tells you that your public health control has to be able to target that group. So if you go in speaking Georgian and with signage that's in Georgian, you won't reach that community or the Armenian community, the second most affected uh, ethnic enclave for anthrax. So how control is distributed affects who's infected. So that's important. Now, one of the things that we find when we sort of think about anthrax in the tropics versus anthrax in the mid-latitude grasslands. So here in the US, it's kind of a subtropic and mid-latitude grassland disease. Same with Southern Africa, where we see the most uh, wildlife anthrax every year. Um, we see it happening in the grasslands and we see it being uh, essentially a springtime disease in that latitude uh, as grasses are greening up and then you're hitting the hot summer period and starting to go down to a dry down, that's when we see anthrax the worst. Now when we get into the tropics, that signal is harder to find. Um, and so what we find in Ghana, where we've done the most uh, detailed look as a lab, for my lab uh, at anthrax in West Africa, uh, is that it's highly predicted by rainfall. So when you get to the end of the rainy season and it starts drying out, so again, you start browning down, uh, we see a spike in anthrax. Now what we see nationally in Ghana is that anthrax tends to be bimodal because of the difference in precipitation patterns at the coast from more northern dryland Ghana. When you get up into the northern part of Ghana where anthrax is the most severe, it has a single peak and that comes at the end of the rainy season, we see a peak in anthrax. Um, when we start to look at this issue of uh, B. serious biovar anthracis, we get an even different picture. So notice earlier, I was showing you maps of uh, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad with confirmed bacillus anthracis. We can also see there are areas in that region that have isolated uh, bacillus serious biovar anthracis. And notice it was originally isolated in Thai National Park, far to the west of the red box there. Uh, the red box is identifying the areas where I showed you some work. Um, in Thai National Park, we have Ghana and Togo pinched in between there, and those are two countries, and Burkina Faso to the north, three countries with very severe uh, anthrax risk. In fact, um, finishing a paper with our partners in Ghana today, in fact, um, and they see some of the highest human mortality rates from anthrax in the world. Thank you, Sarah. So what about the Ghanaian situation? So what we looked at here uh, is taking a random forest approach, so a genetic algorithm that finds relationships building, basically building uh, regression trees to try and find the best relationship between climatic indicators and anthrax occurrence data. So what you're looking at on the right here from green to red is sort of the anthrax predicted risk for Ghana. And notice northeasternmost Ghana is where the risk is the highest, sort of the true 
savanna, the dry savanna of Ghana. Um, so that's our area to focus on. Now, the other thing I have uh, here on screen is some laboratory work that Mike Norris has been leading for us. So what you're looking at here is a few moments ago, I mentioned that those strains from Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, Mali, that WAG group, those are the four countries it's been confirmed in, that WAG group, Western Africa group, that lacks anthros, uh, appears to be more lethal, or at least at a lower infectious dose, than other strains of Bacillus anthracis. So what you're looking at on the bottom here is a laboratory experiment that Mike did in a BSL-2 laboratory, where he took a well-known laboratory strain called STERN, which is what we call a vaccine strain. It doesn't uh, easily cause disease. And he actually knocked out the anthros in it and looked at whether or not its infectivity changes. And it does. So what we have in Ghana is a situation where human mortality is very high, uh, livestock risk is high, control is difficult. For those of you that have worked in Ghana before, uh, not a huge set of uh, easily connected roads throughout the region, lots of livestock uh, spread out, and lots of uh, trans uh, humans and migration between Burkina, Togo, and Ghana. Uh, as well as uh, to, uh, to Cote d'Ivoire to the west. So the way these uh, animals are being moved around from border to border or country to country challenges our ability to uh, clearly interact with those groups and get vaccine distributed properly. Um, so where the diagnostics comes in is how do we know if it's anthracis or serious? So I'm going to just move quickly here to show you that uh, you don't always have to look much further than the basement of your own building. Uh, there was a primate uh, bone collection in the anthropology department. They asked us to screen that for B. serious biovar anthracis. We did. Uh, we put together an assay in my lab to find it, uh, and we did. We found it several times, and we're now one of the only academic institutions that has this strain in the collection. What you're looking at there is a tooth where we we recovered the bacteria from the tooth. And again, as I showed earlier, it's indistinguishable from anthrax. So uh, I illustrate this as just sort of a reminder. Sorry, I think I froze there for a moment. Just sort of a reminder that our ability to discriminate whether it's B anthracis or B serious might affect the way we treat the disease in humans. It also determines whether or not the vaccine might be efficacious. We don't yet know if the anthrax vaccine for B. anthracis works against B. serious, but we do know that it is found in livestock and primates. So it, proposes, it poses an immediate threat to our endangered primates. Chimpanzees and gorillas highly sensitive to this with a large number of die-offs in recent years. And what we found uh, working with the partners in, in uh, Koch Institute in Germany and our partners in anthropology is that lower primates are getting the disease and chimpanzees are probably eating them uh, for transmission. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about uh, is the situation in Vietnam. It's a study that we initiated, uh, it, preliminary, a pilot study in 2017 that is now in a fully funded five year project. You've heard me talk about One Health today uh, and the need for it in Georgia. Well, we are implementing it in Vietnam. So we have a five-year project between the University of Florida, the Department of Animal Health, uh, which serves as the National Veterinary Service in Vietnam, and then the National Institutes of Hygiene and Epidemiology, which operates like a CDC research arm in Vietnam. So we have true uh, One Health. And our goal is to look at the distribution of anthrax and a second bacteria called uh, brucella, which is milkborne, which is the most prevalent zoonotic disease in the world, but difficult to diagnose and, and treated, uh, under, underrepresented and undertreated. So we're focused on six provinces in Vietnam. This is where anthrax is persisting. 
And one thing I will say is that in Vietnam, they already have joint national documentation justifying the need for One Health. And so that gives us a mechanism, a political bureaucratic mechanism to bring these groups together in ways that are difficult in other areas. Um, we have had success in Ghana at getting our Ministry of Health partners and our veterinary service partners together and holding a series of roundtables to improve how they survey for anthrax. Um, Vietnam bureaucratically is a step ahead of them. Uh, and so this is sort of how we've taken the show on the road out into the remote northern mountainous provinces of Vietnam. So the first thing I'll say about Vietnam and Ghana that they share in common, even though Ghana is nearly flat compared to Vietnam, uh, is it's very hard to get to where the anthrax risk is the highest. This is what it looks like from the yard of, of an anthrax case where a 16 year old died of anthrax uh, just before I got there. Um, each of those houses on the hillside uh, are separate houses that have to be surveyed uh, during an outbreak response. Um, and then of course we have the laboratory capacity. So what I wanna end with today is this. Uh, Anthrax is a known entity. It's a known problem that's been identified as a One Health problem in Vietnam. Our preliminary work has showed that over the last 25 years in Vietnam, the human case rate has been flat or stable. Now, it's not zero, uh, but it is not changing, which means that control measures are not improving the status of the disease. They're just maintaining it. So we want to solve that problem. The second thing that we've identified when we started looking out in these rural communities, uh, we've started doing surveillance, uh, serological surveillance for brucella, another milkborne disease that has, uh, can have long lasting effect and reinfection in the case. Uh, it's not a reportable disease in Vietnam. It's not part of that One Health program. And what we found so far is about one and a half percent seroprevalence, which is relatively high for brucella. And we found that uh, in uh, two separate cases, uh, those humans that we had their serum because they had anthrax were positive for brucella antibodies, meaning that both of these zoonotic diseases can affect the same human. So their disease burden is very high one disease that's part of a surveillance program, one disease that isn't even on the radar. So uh, that's a major issue we want to sort out. And then the other issue we've been showing is that their, uh, anthra their brucella seropositive rate is very, very high in the swine population, which presents another animal risk uh, because swine uh, pork meat is the most important meat uh, in Vietnam. So uh, two different disease risks playing out there. Now, each of these diseases also have major implications across the rest of the tropics, in particularly across uh, tropical Africa. So I just wanted to talk briefly about this brucella. These are both uh, long-studied and underreported diseases worldwide um, that are zoonoses that are playing out all the time. So they're not at pandemic status, but certainly at a status that we should be watching and, uh, and preventing. Um, so I'll uh, end there and hopefully uh, open some discussion. I think Sarah, I, I think I was off by a minute.